Take a moment to consider the human hand and everything that it's able to do. An absolutely remarkable designed instrument that we'll be exploring in depth in a few days' time. It's so remarkable that you can actually make the argument that the rest of the upper limb, with all of its elaborate musculoskeletal compartments and neurovascular bundles, serves the sole purpose of positioning the all-important hand to perform its function. Keep that in mind as we begin our journey into the upper limb with a look at the shoulder girdle. Good day, and welcome to this installment of the Gross Anatomy video podcast series. I'm Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Today, we start our journey into the upper limb by looking at its connection with the axial skeleton through the shoulder region. A moderate length session compared to the previous session, but note that there is a KLE activity associated with this lesson and pretty much with all the lessons to follow. Hopefully, you have a bit of a feel as to whether this is advantageous to your learning at this point and if it's worth your time to continue with. For today's lesson, we're going to look at the joints and muscles that make up the shoulder girdle and their neurovascular supply. We'll also take an anatomical look at the mammary glands and discuss their function in milk production for child feeding. For this first lesson, we will examine the osteology and arthrology of the joints that contribute to the movements at the shoulder girdle and analyze how their architecture accommodates movements, including the specific biomechanics of scapulohumeral rhythm. We'll also be looking at a variety of injuries that occur to these structures. Let's start with an overview of the shoulder region. The shoulder girdle is our first stop on our journey into the upper limb. It's the musculoskeletal framework that anchors the upper limb to the thorax and permits a wide range of motions. These motions allow for positioning of the upper limb, and more specifically the hand, through their actions upon the humerus. This mobility comes at a cost, however, as an inherent lack of stability makes the region susceptible to a variety of musculoskeletal injuries. The shoulder can be divided into three subregions, the pectoral region anteriorly, the scapular region posteriorly, and the deltoid region laterally. Muscles can be broadly divided into axiohumeral, which anchor to the thorax and vertebral column, and scapulohumeral, which anchor to the scapula. We begin the lesson with a study of the pectoral girdle, bones that anchor the upper limb to the axial skeleton. This includes the clavicle and scapula. Although not technically part of the pectoral girdle, we'll include the humerus in this discussion due to its importance in muscle attachment and contribution to the shoulder joint. The clavicle is an S-shaped bone found in the superior pectoral region, which offers protection to delicate neurovascular structures which pass inferior to it. It serves as the true anchor between the axial skeleton and upper limb through a broad articulating surface on its sternal end. Laterally, the clavicle compresses into the wedge-shaped acromial end that articulates with the acromion process of the scapula. The superior surface of the clavicle is entirely smooth and can be easily palpated on your own body just deep to the skin. The inferior surface is rough in appearance as a result of muscular and ligamentous attachments. The scapula forms the connection between the clavicle and humerus. It's broad and flat, forming the bony wall of the posterior shoulder over top of ribs 2 through 7 in anatomical position. Its triangular shape allows us to define three borders, superior, medial, and lateral, thickened from the pull of muscle attachments. These borders are separated by the superior, inferior, and lateral angles. The head of the scapula is found at the lateral angle, squaring off into the glenoid fossa, which articulates with the head of the humerus to form the shoulder joint. Running obliquely along the posterior surface is the scapular spine, which divides the posterior surface of the scapula into the supraspinous fossa superiorly and the infraspinous fossa inferiorly. The spine runs superolaterally, curving anteriorly to form the acromion process. This forms the roof of the subacromial tunnel, in which a number of structures pass and have the tendency to become impinged. Inframedial to the acromion process is the coracoid process, a prominent bony protrusion which serves as a site of muscle and ligament attachment. Despite its relatively large size, the only bony attachment between the scapula and the axial skeleton is through the acromion process to the clavicle. The bone is heavily enveloped in muscle, which permits a great deal of glide and rotation in the scapula. These movements serve to angle the glenoid fossa, permitting a greater range of motion at the shoulder, 
Although strictly speaking not part of the pectoral girdle, an examination of the proximal portion of the humerus is necessary in studying the shoulder region. The smooth, rounded head of the humerus projects superomedially for articulation with the glenoid fossa at the shoulder joint. It is connected to the shaft through the anatomical neck of the humerus, which is the site of the proximal epiphyseal growth plate. Just distal to the neck are two prominent projections, the greater tubercle superolaterally and the lesser tubercle inferomedially, which serves as sites for muscle insertion of the scapulohumeral muscles. Between these tubercles is an impression called the intertubercular or bicipital groove. As the name implies, the groove is formed by the tendon from the long head of the biceps brachii, which as we will see, passes between the two tubercles. Note that a number of prominent muscles attach to the medial and lateral edges of the intertubercular groove, including the latissimus dorsi, described previously, and the pectoralis major and teres major, which will be discussed today. Further down the shaft of the humerus is the surgical neck. From an anatomical perspective, the true neck of a bone is the site of the growth plate, where the majority of longitudinal growth occurs. This region was previously identified. The surgical neck is unique to the humerus. It represents a narrowing in the shaft inferior to the greater and lesser tubercles. It gets its name from its clinical importance as a common site of humeral fractures. Finally, we can identify the deltoid tuberosity for insertion of the deltoid muscle laterally along the mid-shaft of the humerus. Having identified the important bones of the shoulder region, we can now address the relevant joints of this region. First is the sternoclavicular joint which serves as the one true anchor between the axial and appendicular skeleton. It's a synovial saddle type joint, allowing movement in two different planes, horizontal flexion extension and abduction adduction. The joint is reinforced by a number of strong ligaments. The anterior and posterior sternoclavicular ligaments represent thickenings of the joint capsule, preventing anterior and posterior dislocations. The extrinsic costoclavicular ligament anchors the clavicle to the first rib, preventing superior dislocation. The sternoclavicular joint is distinguished by the presence of a fibrocartilaginous articular disc. The primary effect is to permit a very small amount of rotation of the clavicle on the sternum, despite it being a saddle joint. Shoulder movements are facilitated at the sternoclavicular joint, whose function is similar to the boom arm on a crane. The clavicle can be elevated by 60 degrees during arm abduction or shift either anterior or posterior by 30 degrees in either direction during horizontal flexion extension of the arm, respectively. This small degree of movement, combined with the strength of reinforcing ligaments, makes dislocations uncommon. Trauma to this region is more likely to result in clavicular fractures than in dislocations. You can demonstrate the movements at the sternoclavicular joint on yourself by bringing both hands up to your front, keeping one hand stable while moving the forearm of your other arm around. In this position, the forearm acts like the clavicle. Notice that I can elevate, depress, protract, and retract, and also get a slight bit of rotation within this region, all with minimal movements between the two hands. The acromial clavicular joint between the distal end of the clavicle and scapula is a planar synovial joint, allowing gliding motions between the two bones. The joint is encased in a capsule that is thickened along its superior margin, forming the intrinsic acromial clavicular ligament. Projecting inferiorly from the acromial clavicular ligament is a wedge shaped articular disc that partially separates the two joint surfaces. The majority of support for the acromioclavicular joint comes from the extracapsular coracoclavicular ligament, which, as the name implies, spans from the clavicle to the coracoid process. The ligament is actually made up of two separate bands, each named for their geometric appearance. The conoid ligament is the more medial of the two bands, with the apex attaching to the coracoid process. The trapezoid ligament lies laterally and runs at an oblique angle to insert on the clavicle. Both ligaments serve to suspend the scapula on the clavicle, resisting the depressive forces of gravitational pull from the upper limb on the scapula. Although not actually a part of the acromioclavicular joint, this is a good opportunity to talk about the coracoacromial ligament, running from the acromion process to the coracoid process. Now normally when we think of ligaments, they run between separate bones to reinforce a joint. It's therefore a bit unusual to consider a ligament connecting a bone to itself. It helps to form the roof of the subacromial tunnel and can contribute to impingement syndrome in this region. 
As a planar joint, a small amount of gliding is allowed to occur at the acromial clavicular joint. Anteroposterior gliding allows for a greater degree of protraction and retraction, facilitating a wider range of shoulder motion. Having discussed the sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular joints, we can now discuss the role of scapulothoracic movement to maximize shoulder range of motion. Take arm abduction, for example. A healthy individual can easily raise their arms from their side, achieving 180 degrees of full abduction. What is not inherently obvious, however, is the role of scapular rotation to achieve this feat. The synchronization between scapular rotation and glenohumeral abduction, called scapulohumeral rhythm, has been extensively studied. During the first 30 degrees of abduction, movement is exclusively at the glenohumeral joint. Beyond this, however, every two degrees of glenohumeral abduction is accompanied by one degree of upward rotation of the scapula. If it were not for the movement of the scapula, shoulder abduction would be limited to about 120 degrees. Similar rhythm patterns are seen with other movements we traditionally attribute to the shoulder joint alone. The glenohumeral joint is what we traditionally think of as the true shoulder joint. It's a synovial ball and socket joint formed by the convex humeral head and the shallow concavity of the glenoid fossa. This architecture makes the shoulder highly mobile, permitting movement in all planes of direction, but also highly unstable due to the limited contact between the articulating surfaces. This is somewhat improved by the presence of the glenoid labrum, a fibrocartilaginous rim that attached to the outer margin of the glenoid fossa. The joint capsule is lax to accommodate joint motions. This is particularly evident along the inferior margin in anatomical position, where the capsule droops inferiorly to accommodate abduction. There is a small degree of reinforcement through an anterior thickening of the capsule, the intrinsic glenohumeral ligament, as well as the extrinsic coracohumeral ligament superiorly, but their support is minimal. As we will see later in the lesson, most reinforcement for the glenohumeral joint comes from the active contraction of the scapulohumeral muscles. The synovial membrane of the glenohumeral joint herniates through an opening in the joint capsule to become the subscapular bursa, which limits friction between the subscapularis muscle and the head of the scapula. It also lines the tendons for the long head of the biceps brachii muscle, which fuses with the glenohumeral joint capsule as it inserts into the supraglenoid tubercle. With a bit of practice, a number of the aforementioned structures can be identified in an AP radiographic view of the shoulder. Note that many of these structures are superimposed over top of one another, requiring skill in deciphering different outlines. The spine of the scapula can be seen arching forward as the acromion process. The acromioclavicular joint appears as a discrete line separating the two bony surfaces. The coracoid process can be seen just inferior to the region. The glenoid fossa and humeral head are identified in close approximation. The greater and lesser tubercles of the humerus can also be distinguished in this view. We'll take a few minutes to explore some of the more common clinical presentations associated with this region. First, we'll look at clavicular fractures. The clavicle is arguably the most commonly broken bone in the body due to its superficial location and the curvature producing a structural weakness along the shaft. Mid-shaft fractures are most common and result in a characteristic deformity. The proximal end of the shaft is displaced superiorly due to the unopposed pull of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and the distal end is depressed due to the gravitational pull on the upper limb suspended from the coracoclavicular ligaments. This creates a step deformity that is apparent on visual inspection as well as x-ray. Fractures are typically repaired using internal fixation devices such as surgical plates or screws. Any disruption of the acromioclavicular joint is referred to as a shoulder separation, which typically results from a downward blow on the acromion process. This is in stark contrast to shoulder dislocations, which occur exclusively at the glenohumeral joint. There are three major classes of separation, and an additional three that are variations on the type 3 separations. In type 1, there is partial tearing of the joint capsule, with little to no damage to the coracoclavicular ligament. In this instance, there is no visible deformity, but the patient presents with point tenderness over the joint capsule. In type 2 separations, there is full disruption in the joint capsule with incomplete tearing of the coracoclavicular ligaments.
With type 2 separations, the joint surfaces are normally opposed, but the acromion can be depressed if the patient is asked to hold a heavy weight in the hand on the affected side. Type 3 separations result from complete disruption of both the joint capsule and the coracoclavicular ligaments. This creates a step deformity of separation between the acromion and clavicle that only disappears when the weight of the upper limb is fully supported. Type 3 separations are readily apparent in radiographic imaging as a pronounced space between the two joint surfaces. Here we see a demonstration of a patient with a separated left shoulder. Notice that, whereas the right clavicle moves with the upper limb, as previously discussed, there is complete disjunction between the clavicle and proximal arm during movements on the left side. Also note that the patient seems rather comfortable with moving his limb back and forth, despite the injury. This contrasts sharply with glenohumeral dislocations. True shoulder dislocations at the glenohumeral joint are fairly common due to the laxity of the joint capsule. It typically results from an anteriorly directed force to the back of the proximal portion of the humerus, often when the shoulder is in an abducted or an extended position. This results in an antero-inferior dislocation of the humeral head relative to the glenoid fossa. The patient presents with a pronounced acromion due to a sag in the deltoid muscle and the shaft of the humerus slightly abducted and externally rotated. Again, note the prominence of the acromion, the depression and abducted position of the humerus, and the lack of a step deformity as we would expect with shoulder separation. The head may be palpable in the axilla, and the disarticulation between the humeral head and the glenoid fossa is obvious on x-ray. Superior and or posterior dislocations are relatively rare due to the bony projection offered by the acromion and scapular spine. With an uncomplicated glenohumeral dislocation, the joint may be externally reduced by applying an external rotation force to the humerus. This should only be attempted by a qualified physician and only after a radiological workup to rule out fractures within the vicinity, which may complicate the reduction. The reduction is further complicated by a number of neurovascular structures in the area, which we'll address later that may complicate the matter. Just promise me, if you ever experience a shoulder dislocation, don't ever do that. <laughs> As mentioned earlier, the glenoid labrum is a fibrocartilaginous ring attached to the rim of the glenoid fossa. Trauma to the shoulder can sometimes result in avulsion of the labrum from the rim of the glenoid fossa. These tears tend to occur in specific places due to common mechanisms of trauma. An upward force through the shaft of the humerus, for example, compresses the humeral head against the superior rim of the glenoid labrum. This can result in tearing in the 12 o'clock position, an injury known as a superior labral anterior to posterior, or slap tear. These tears are actually quite common in throwing sports such as baseball. It likely has to do with excessive torque on the long head of the biceps brachii. Remember, this muscle attaches to the superior rim of the glenoid labrum. The act of throwing generates a significant amount of torque through this tendon, which can tear the glenoid labrum from its attachment point to the glenoid fossa. Another common tear occurs during antero-inferior shoulder dislocations, where the humeral head pulls the antero-inferior portion of the labrum away from the glenoid fossa. This is known as a bankart tear for the physician that first characterized the injury. Although rare, a third type of glenolabral tear, known as a reverse bankart lesion, results in a tear along the posterior limb of the labrum. These injuries are characterized by a clunking sensation during shoulder movements. Another diagnostic test, known as an arthrogram, involves injection of radioopaque medium into the joint cavity. The separation between the labrum and fossa can be visualized on MRI as a collection of fluid between these two structures. Labral tears can be surgically repaired through the suturing of the glenoid labrum to the fossa using bone anchors. That wraps up our discussion of the bones and joints of the shoulder girdle. On the other side of the break, we'll take a look at the muscles and some of their arteries, veins, and nerves in this region. See you then.